Welcome to This Week in Morgan County. I'm your host, Russell Mokhyber. Our guest this week is Jason Armentrout. Jason is a candidate for West Virginia Senate in the 15th Senatorial District. Jason, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And where is the 15th? The 15th District is a, it's a pretty good-sized district geographically. Um, in my home county, Mineral County, uh, it covers most of Mineral County other than Kaiser, Piedmont, and Elk Garden. Uh, it's kind of a funny-shaped district in our county because it, it doesn't, it, it includes Fort Ashby, which is where I live, Ridgely, Carpendale, uh, Short Gap. Um, but then when you go to Kaiser, Kaiser's in District 14, but then if you go up, if you're familiar with the area, if you go up Route 50, Route 220, you go back into New Creek. Now, New Creek is part of District 15, so it kinda, it's kind of a, a, a wedge. So it's in that District part of Mineral 14. County, yeah. but then it's also all of Hampshire, right? All of Hampshire, all, all of, of Morgan, Morgan, and then mainly Hedgesville uh, and, and the Inwood end of Berkeley County and as well, County. yeah. <laughs> The seat is held currently by Charles Trump, who's yes. from Morgan County. Yes. And there is no Democrat in the race. You're running as an independent. Yeah, I'm non affiliated. I'm running as an independent. How do you get on the ballot as an independent? Uh, as a, a, an independent or a third party candidate, what you have to do, you have to go based on the prior election. Uh, I believe it's 1% of the total votes of the last election, which would be the 2014 election, you have to gather signatures uh, equivalent to 1% of the total vote count. So how many signatures that. do you need? Uh, the magic number is, I believe, 263, but I round up to 270 to be yeah. safe. But I want to shoot for 500 signatures just to be safe because they all have to be in that district. I can get Mineral County signatures, mm -hmm but they all have to be in District 15, district. Mineral County. And you're going to be running, right, your name will be on the ballot opposed to Charles Trump in November. Yes. And um, tell us a little bit about yourself. You're born and raised in Mineral County? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I was born in Cumberland, but I was raised all my life in, in, uh, in Mineral County. I grew up in, in Carpendale, West Virginia, what, what would become Carpendale. Um, what was the work of your folks? My, my dad actually worked, he worked for the state of Maryland as a right-of-way agent, but he also uh, was a municipal politician. He was a big part of establishing the town of Carpendale. Uh, he was a councilman for, for, since 1990, and the last 10 years he served as the mayor of Carpendale. So he's been involved in municipal politics in West Virginia since 1990. Uh, actively involved, in, and that's where I get a lot of my interest in politics at the state and local level. Uh, was, he a, from, was he an independent also? Or? He was. Uh, he was kind of a, a, a more independent, but he was registered Republican. Okay. You grew up in a conservative household. Pretty conservative, yes. Yeah, Christian, uh, um, evangelical household. Yes. And and what is your current work? My current work for the last 22 years, I've been a school teacher. Uh, I started my career uh, in Hampshire County Schools. Uh, I taught a few years uh, at a small Christian school in Cumberland, Maryland. And for the last 14 years, I've taught at Frankfort High School uh, in Mineral County. I also coach wrestling. Uh, I did coach football for a while, coach track. So I've been involved in public education most of my education career, most of my teaching career. And, that's where I am currently. Now, Charles Trump, there was no Democrat who ran against Charles Trump. Correct. And um, I guess Charlie thought, hey, I'm going to be unopposed. But then you said, I'm running. Why? Well, I, I don't, I, 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 there have been several races in the past where uh, people were unopposed. And, and I really don't believe anyone should have a free pass to any office, whether it be local, state, federal. There have been times in West Virginia where we've had Congress people unopposed. Um, I, I don't believe that should ever be the case. But what uh, was, it, if, if you wholeheartedly supported Charles's uh, politics and what he was doing in Charleston, you probably wouldn't have run. But something, was it the teacher strike that pushed you into running? It, it was, it was. Yeah, the teacher strike was a, a, a part of it, absolutely. Just the way that that teachers uh, have always been dealt with as collateral damage. Um, 
and, and, and both parties are guilty of it. It happened with both parties uh, years ago, uh, 2012, 2013, 2014, uh, when the Democrats had solid control of both houses and the governor's mansion. Um, we, we pushed for uh, teacher raises, better benefits, and back then they said the money wasn't there. In fact, um, Senator Fern, or, well, Senator Ferns, he was Delegate Ferns back then. He was a Democrat. Much of the same rhetoric that he used throughout the strike, the tough talk against teachers, he said the same thing years ago when he was a Democrat in the House of Delegates alongside of his Democratic uh, cohorts uh, in, in the Senate, one of which uh, was, the, uh, was the husband of the Secretary of State at the time. So it's not about Democrat and Republican. I mean, the governor went from being a, a Democrat to being a Republican. Correct. And what I noticed in this teacher strike was, in the beginning, before the teachers went on strike, uh, the legis all the politicians, pretty much, the legislator and legislature and the governor were saying, we don't have the money. We have money for 1%. And the yes. governor says it's an economic miracle what's happening in West Virginia, and here's 1% for the teachers. Yeah. Uh, and then after two weeks, everything changed. And, and the legislature said, okay, you want 5%, you have 5%. What, how did that happen exactly? Well, a lot of it was the work stoppage. I mean, we put them in a position where something had to be done. And much of it, and, and I'll be honest, a lot of it started with the GO 365 program with PEIA. Explain what GO 365 GO, GO 365 was a, 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 a program put in place by PEIA that basically forced all uh, policyholders to abide by a certain standard of, um, of health management that basically forced them to turn over a lot of things that should be kept private to the insurance company and basically based on the health results your premiums would be determined and your out of cost would be determined upon those results so it was a clear invasion of privacy on people's health and there was something about people being required to wear Fitbits, Fitbits or something yes. to see how many steps they take during the day or something like that yeah Fitbits or any app with that that, that could be uh, um, used with an Apple iWatch. There were several options you could use, but at the same time, I mean, you're, you're talking about a lot of information other than that that really should be between the patient and the doctor. And, but that was gotten rid of early on in the, in, the, in the work stoppage. Yes. I mean, maybe before the work stoppage. And, but the pressure continued to build. It wasn't just that issue. No. That's, what was what was it that was drive the driving force among the teachers that got them so upset? Just over time, you can only take so much, and, and it just years and years of asking for cost of living uh, adjustments, raises, uh, raises that are we're not looking to be super rich. We're just looking for cost adjustments to help us enjoy a decent middle class standard of living. We're not asking for the world. And when you have politicians that year upon year when you do this, and they say the money's not there, the money's not there, the money's not there, there's only so much of that that you can take. And then you have several politicians that get up and, and they grandstand and they, they make statements uh, about teachers being whiners or being greedy. There was a governor years ago, we, we went to this rally, uh, Wear Red for Ed rally, I believe it was 2008. It was the year we had the one day stoppage. I was teaching at Frankfurt. And we were at a rally in Romney and the current governor at the time didn't even take the time to talk to us. We were there, we were all wearing red for Ed didn't even take the time to talk to us and when he did make any kind of statement he basically said that teachers need to be careful not to come off as greedy as self-serving and just 
when you have politicians that, that treat us that way, there's only so much of it you can take. Now, Charles Trump is not known as a grandstander. No. And we haven't heard that kind of rhetoric that you were referring to from him. No. But what was it about Charles Trump during the work stoppage that made you think that you should run? Well, Charles, uh, he's, he, you can tell he works in the banking industry. He's a, he's a money and, and, and numbers type of guy. And he's chair of our local bank. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. And, and he's very intelligent, very intelligent. Uh, but much of the numbers that, that it seemed like he was using was more or less driven by the unity of the Republican Party, basically saying, look, it's not here. The money's not here. Um, well, then, after the stoppage, somehow the money was there. Um, were you concerned, were the teachers concerned, and I've heard this, but I don't know if it's true at Frankfurt, were the teachers wary about going out on strike? Were they nervous? Were they concerned about being arrested or... Um, you know, violating the law. Sure, we all were. We all were. I was. Um, and and the timing of it, the first two days of it were during the uh, state wrestling tournament. Well, I had wrestlers that I had to take down to Huntington. Uh, and uh, so I, I came out the first day of it for, for about the first three hours of it. And then I went up and, and picked my wrestlers up and drove them down to Huntington so they could compete. The AFT and WVEA did say that if you were a coach, uh, you wouldn't be considered crossing the picket line if you continued to coach uh, in state tournaments and postseason. Because basketball was heading into postseason, mm -hmm. wrestling was the state tournament, um, girls basketball was, was you know, the postseason as well. So there were a lot of us who were coaching as well, and that was a big concern. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're never, when you have to take such a big step, it's never comfortable. Sure, you're going to be nervous. Sure, you're going to be scared. Uh, and all of us were, absolutely. The legislature is dominated by corporate interests. Mm -hmm. And when they say we don't have the money, there are all, there's always like all these freebies and giveaways to big corporate interests. You've said that you thought that one way to help the state of West Virginia was to in increase the severance on uh, oil and gas, the yes. oil and gas industry. Tell us about that. What is it now? Where do you think it should be? Well, for years, for years, the West Virginia Center on Budget and Policy have been, have been calling for this. Um, but all we ever hear is that it would make uh, the natural gas industry less competitive compared to what other states do. Uh, Pennsylvania, for example, has no severance. But what's overlooked in Pennsylvania is they have an impact fee on when they break ground to drill a well. So it's, when we're, and this was pushed for by Republican Governor Tom Corbett when he was governor. No, he didn't call for a severance fee, a severance tax, but he did manage to pull in some revenue from the natural gas industry. Now Pennsylvanians are calling for a severance tax, like we are as well, um, on natural gas because they've capped so many wells and the drilling of new wells has slowed down and the revenue uh, flow coming into Harrisburg has slowed down. So they're, just because they have no severance tax doesn't mean that they're not calling for one. Um, but we've heard time and time again that this is going to make... Um, us less competitive with other states. I, I disagree. I, I, I like what Senator Ojeda said. It may drive the first two bidders out, but there's a line of people waiting to get that natural gas. As much natural gas as West Virginia has beneath us, someone's going to come after it. Someone wants it. Someone is going to pay for it. And, and we need to bargain. We need to, 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 to bargain in a way that we are able to take care of our people. West Virginia has a history of giving away so many natural resources right out from under us, timber, coal, to out-of-state interests, and we've never benefited, truly benefited from, from the extraction of those natural resources. Other states have. 
where those companies are headquartered that were part of the extraction. We never have. And there's been so many, so much dirty pool in the past that, that uh, makes West Virginians very untrusting of the natural resource companies as well. You look at the history of coal and, and, and some of the, and, and timber, some of the dirty tactics out of state uh, corporations did in, in acquiring land and, and basically taking over county governments, taking over town governments. Olga Coal, they used to own the city of Colwood. They own total towns, total, total uh, municipalities. Um, you mentioned Senator Ojeda. He's a state senator from coal country in the south. So down Logan County, yes. County. Yeah. His name is Richard Ojeda. He's running for Congress, and he's actually got a pretty good shot at making it. Uh, yeah, former armor absolutely. paratrooper. Are you, and he was the teacher's, uh, he was like the star of the Senate for the teachers. Would yes, you say he that's was. true? Yeah, and he why, was. why is it, I mean, you seem to be modeling your campaign a little bit after his. Why is sure. that? Why is that? Well, he, he's more of a straight shooter. He, he is a Democrat, but he, he doesn't seem to be dictated by a party platform. I mean, he does, when it comes to taking up for teachers, he had our backs. Um, he, he really seemed very authentic in his, his demeanor, um, said the right things that, that we needed to hear, really seemed like he meant it as well. And uh, it's one of those things time will tell, but I really get the sense with him that he really did mean what he said and he would back it up if he was put into a position of, of greater leadership where he could be more influential. I mean, he, as far as being in the minority party, he did what he could do as far as he could, as far as Senate, pro Senate protocol would allow him to, uh, to fight for us. Um, and he was a big part of bringing the Senate back in the end, and it took him forever. The Senate was the main body holding out. The House was way more cooperative. But in the end, I credit Senator Ojeda with bringing the Senate, bringing some sense to the state Senate. Teachers are running across the state. Uh, and I know that in Eric Householder's seat, there's a Republican, Wendy Byrd, running in the primary. Yeah. And then the Democrat, Barbara Frankenberry, is going to take on whoever wins that primary. Uh -huh. um, you're running in the, this senatorial district. Um, are there others that you know of, uh, teachers running for the legislature in West Virginia? Uh, down in Point Pleasant. Um, I can't remember the young lady's name who's running as an independent for the Senate seat, but I do know uh, also in Point Pleasant, the delegate seat that, that covers Point Pleasant, uh, Coach Mullins, who's an assistant coach at Point Pleasant High School, he's assistant wrestling coach, he's running for that delegate seat. And I believe both of them, uh, yeah, Todd Mullins, uh, both of them are running uh, as independents. So there's a... There's a uh string of wrestling coaches running for the legislature. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. This, yeah. What is, uh, what is, um, uh, you, what do you teach at Frankfurt High School? I teach social studies, special ed, English, uh, multi-certified. And how, how is this race, once you announced, how has this effect, changed the dynamic of teaching? I mean, has this become an issue in your class? Well, my students, uh, they, they, they seem very supportive. Uh, they, they, they ask a lot of questions about it. Um, they, uh, they seem very interested in it. And I, I'm hoping that uh, one of the things this can be, uh, this race can be kind of like a uh, civics lesson for them, for me and them. Uh, it's first time experience for me as well. So. Is, it, is it, are you... Um are you in it as a civics lesson, or are you in it to win it? I'm is in it, it to win it. Is I'm in it to win it, what definitely. Makes you think, do you think this is a wave election that teachers are going to uh, have a big impact on this election? Well, I, don't, I wouldn't call it a wave election. Um, I, I would say it's more uh, of an election where people are going to listen more. I, I believe uh, that just being a D or being an R isn't going to do it. Now, I, I do have the concern about straight party voters. I do need to get through to them. Please don't vote straight party. Well, you can know, apparently the law has changed in West Virginia. There's no more 
straight party uh, lever or, you know, you can't do right, it anymore. Right. Just like you can go through and do it. Yeah. But you're going to have to look for okay. the independent. Yeah, yeah you're gonna have that's to look good. For the that's, that's great. But yeah, that was a concern. But I, I believe that people are going to be more speculative in terms of their choices. They're going to, um, they're going to want to listen to what they have to say more. Uh, as opposed to just, you know, this, I'm a lifelong Republican, I'm just going to vote for the Republican, or I'm a lifelong Democrat, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vote for the Democrat. Um, over the weekend in Kaiser, we actually had a debate, and it was a, a very good debate. To my knowledge, I don't think we've ever had local debates with local candidates and, and uh, state candidates for legislative office in Mineral County. I can't remember the last time we've had something like that. And, and that debate was sponsored by who? It was the um, the Allegheny Small Business Consortium. And, uh, and it was you on Charlie Trump. That was one Yeah, that was one of the debates. Yeah, Charlie Well, we hope we can hold the debate here between you and Charlie in Morgan County. That, that would be, be wonderful. That would be nice. All right, last yeah. question. Sure. Any lessons from wrestling that apply to politics? Well, to never give up. Never give up. When I was a wrestler, I was only a four-year wrestler. I didn't have a middle school program when I was uh, in middle school. So my first year of wrestling was ninth grade. And, and my first two years of wrestling, I struggled. I struggled with the sport. Or with the sport. And uh, by the time I was an 11th grader, I, I decided I'm going to make it to the state tournament. I'm going to do what it takes. I'm going to go to wrestling camp in the summer. I'm going to do what it takes. And going into my junior year, I actually qualified for the state tournament. And in my senior year, I finished uh, in the top eight in my weight class at the state tournament. So I was going from little to no knowledge of the sport to being a two-time state qualifier. And it only comes from hard work, perseverance, never giving up. Okay. And if people wanted uh, information about your campaign, the website is? The website is Armand Trout for S Senate dot simple site dot com. Uh, it, there's a link to it on my Facebook page as well, Armand Trout for uh, Senate. And that's your Facebook? Yeah, absolutely. Good luck to you. Thank you. And thanks for coming in. Thank you. Thanks and thank you for me. watching This Week in Morgan County.